She barely glanced in my direction as she stormed into the kitchen. Even a simple hello or a familiar smile would have been welcome. But she only smoothed her dress, looked anxiously over her shoulder and said, Remember, I'm out with the girls today. If anything, I have my cell phone, but don't call unless it's an emergency. I looked at her for a bit before answering. I wondered how she could expect me to believe that the tight little black dress she wore was meant for the girls, or the makeup, or the perfume. Did she really expect me to believe that girls like to see girls looking like this? I should have been offended that she thought so lowly of me. I should have been offended that she would allow such a degree of ignorance. But I wasn't offended because I knew I deserved it. After all, she had managed to keep me in the dark about her other relationships far longer than she should have. I was the worst kind of fool. The kind of fool who trusts someone. The kind of person who lets someone in. The kind of person who bets their life on them. A mistake made, a mistake realized, and now. Mistake corrected. Before you go, I finally said, I need you to sit down for a minute so we can talk about something. She didn't even turn around, just made an impatient harumph sound as she rummaged through her purse and said, I'm sorry, honey, but I really have to go. I'm late as it is. I braced myself, expecting an outburst of anger, clutched the beer bottle tightly, but nothing happened. No anger, no rage, no resentment. This disinterested disregard was all too typical behavior for her lately. She brushed me off. She dismissed the children. She rejected herself. And now, we're all used to it. But no more. It was time to act. I tossed the keys she was looking for onto the table. I understand your urgency, I snapped. God knows I do. But if you leave and spend another evening entertaining Carl Jensen without talking to me, I recommend you never come back here again. She froze in place, stood with her hand in her purse for a long moment, but said nothing. What? She finally managed it, her voice thin and disbelieving. What did you say? It won't take more than a minute, I said. Come sit down at the table with me and talk. She lingered for another minute without turning around or responding to my suggestion. She clutched her purse as if it might save her life. But it didn't. Finally, her shoulders slumped, her hands dropped, and she turned around. She looked guilty everywhere but her eyes. They darted around like a trapped animal, wounded and devoid of hope. Staggering, she half sat half, reclined in the chair opposite me. Many quick glances were cast in my direction, many silent searches for information, but nothing that met my gaze. John, she said at last, I, I'm so sorry. Her voice was almost a whisper. Jesus, did she really hope to win on such an insignificant thing as remorse? How lazy you are. Sorry for what? I asked with mock surprise. I can't wait to hear what you've done that you think sorry is going to make things right. She bit her lip. Lowering her gaze to the table, she ran her finger over the area, tracing patterns on the wood. I don't think it'll make it better. I know what a mess I've made, even if you don't believe it. But for what it's worth, I'm sorry for what happened. That was it, I smiled. Be magnanimous, be calm. The first step is behind us. Thank you for having the respect not to lie to my face, I said honestly. Not that it matters. No lie would have saved you from the truth of what I know. But it makes me think that maybe I made the right choice in not leaving. She paled slightly. You're not leaving. I... I don't want you to leave, she whispered. I don't love him, John. I honestly don't. I just... I raised my hand, calling for her silence. When I saw her, ready for action, a temptation rose in my chest. Don't hit her, no matter what you do. It would be so easy, so instantaneous. But if you start, you might never stop. I know you won't, I grimaced, letting him know how valuable that knowledge was to me. Or at least I know you think you don't. Either way, I've already listened to all your little excuses. Listened? She frowned. What do you mean? Well, you silly bye. No. So far, everything's going according to plan. Ignore that tension in your guts. Remember what's at stake. You're doing very well. Don't ruin it now. It's simple, I shrugged. I heard them when you said them to him. If it was possible, she lost even more color and got even smaller in her chair. You... you hurt us? 
I just stared at her, keeping my expression calm, and she looked away. Her eyes were moist. Brilliant, I suppose, was the most appropriate word. She took a deep breath. What are you going to do? I know it feels like I don't love you right now, but I really do. And I don't want to lose what we have. It would kill me if you left. I nodded. I know. Like I said, I heard you explaining all of this to him. I don't need a repeat. I could have killed you, you know. In any one of a thousand moments, I could have reached out and finished your story for you. But I didn't. Think about that. About what that means. Leaning over, I reached down and picked up the heavy envelope. Watching her reaction, I placed it on the table. It was bulging, ready to burst. I ran my hand across the top and patted it for emphasis. In this envelope is everything I know about your affair. She inhaled noisily and examined its thickness once more, eyes wide. I let her realize the full implications for one long, cold, threatening minute. You can review it later. I'm not going to hide anything from you and I'll try to be as straightforward about it as possible. I paused to rub my eyes with my index finger and thumb. Good. Deep breath. You've got everything set up. Now comes the hard part. She stared at the envelope as if it were a live cobra. It's so thick, she whispered. I nodded and patted it again, enjoying the sound of my hand hitting the massive collection. Once I had my suspicions to investigate you, gathering information became shockingly easy. You weren't trying very hard to hide it anymore, were you? I thought you trusted me. I thought I'd be safe that way. I did trust, and I did. It will never, ever happen again. She nodded quickly. And it shouldn't. I'm sorry, John. Please give me a chance to make it up to you. If you agree to stay, I'll... I've already told you, I muttered. I'll stay. And I won't try in vain to kick you out. I'm well aware of how far that would take me. No. If anyone's going to file for divorce, it's going to be you. I ignored the surprised look on her face, choosing my words carefully and trying to separate meaning from reality. The truth was that it had taken me one hour with an attorney, a day of internet searches, and weeks of subsequent mental anguish to figure out how I felt, what I had left to protect in my life, and what I needed to do to survive. Tonight was only the first phase. I swallowed and continued. However, my staying here depends on one thing. Now I spoke in the voice of a leader. Direct, sharp, decisive. I've given this a lot of thought, and while it's obvious to me that you probably still have some love for me, and I can't get rid of my love for you just because it's become inconvenient, the possibility of us being a couple is now completely out of the question. She frowned and opened her mouth to reply, but I held up my hand. <laughs> Your actions and the fact that you got involved in this affair... And the way you're behaving in it make it clear to me that I'm not in a position to do for you what my former friend is now doing. You said it yourself. You told him that you have the best of both worlds. With me, you have love and care and family. With him, you have someone who, uh, turns you inside out. I think that's what you said, I grimaced. With both of us, you get affection and attention. She flinched, hearing her own words. I'm so sorry I said that. But it's not true. It's just... She stammered, perhaps thinking about how impossible it was to convince me of what she'd said, or perhaps going over in her mind the list of other things I must have heard. I'm sorry about the way things turned out, she admitted after a moment. But I don't understand what you're telling me. Another deep breath. Things hadn't turned out to be as unemotional as I'd hoped. I guess nothing ever is. Look, I continued... We live in three basic realities. First, you and I have some form of love for each other. Whether we want to or not, and whether we have the same type of love for each other is irrelevant. The love is there, in one form or another, on both sides. Besides, we have family, we have history. We may even have a future. At those words, she brightened slightly. But the other two realities are this. You have a lover, and I no longer have any feelings for you or for anyone for that matter. You've been very effective at making sure of that. But I will never admit it. Not to you. To anyone. Anyway, it's none of your business anymore. 
<laughs> what her face had started to brighten at the beginning of my speech disappeared. John, she began. I admit I don't want to lose you if I can avoid it, I squeezed out, sticking to the script. But I don't want you to be unhappy. And I certainly don't want you coming to me and trying to reestablish a physical connection that I'm no longer able or willing to maintain. There's only pain waiting for both of us along the way. So, I squared my shoulders and braced myself for the worst. My being in this marriage, my tenure in this relationship depends on you continuing your affair. She started to answer, suddenly tensed, and then her eyes widened incredulously as my words reached her. It's not funny, John. Good, I hummed, because I've never been more serious in my life. If your feelings for him or me start to change in any way, I'm going to ask you to come and talk to me so we can shield the kids from the worst effects of our divorce. Other than that, you mind your own business and I'll mind mine. In essence, it can be business as usual. You can even see him more often if you want. That's what you wanted, isn't it? For you to be together more often? We both nearly died the night I heard that. You didn't even realize how close you were. <laughs> After listening to the tape and looking at the pictures, I stumbled up the stairs. It was the first and final confirmation of what had previously remained only a dark suspicion. I was furious. I was crushed. I honestly thought I was already dead. And there you were, sleeping so peacefully. So content. So happy with the way your life had turned out. I felt sick. I stood over you and wrote our last chapter in my mind with clinical precision. And then you rolled over and woke up. You blinked, squinted, looked at me. I saw worry, honest concern. Then you touched my arm, so gently, and asked if I was okay. When you asked, you sat up, and all that contentment disappeared. And you sounded like you really cared. I shook my head, pushing away the memory of that. She frowned either mulling over what I'd said or wondering what I hadn't said. Jim, she said, some of the things I said when we were, don't, I warned her. Just don't. Stupid woman. The best thing you did was to be honest. Surely you must realize that. So why on earth would you want to give it up now? Uh, anyway, I can't bear to see the pity that will fill your eyes if you start lying to me. I'd like you to start informing me about where you are and what your plans are but I don't want to know any details or talk about anything about it. The only reason I want to know when you're with him is because it's safer for all of us. She wrinkled her nose. I'm not going out with him, John. You're not serious about this whole... Her eyes ran down my face. Are you? As serious as a heart attack. As serious as a man's hand on a woman's throat. It's not the best situation, but best situation is no longer an option, so I chose this one. You can take it as it comes, or we can start talking about divorce. But if you don't want the marriage to fall apart and all your relatives to find out what you've been up to, this is the way it has to be. I'm afraid. What you're doing? It doesn't make any sense to me. I smiled bitterly. Then I guess you know a little bit about how I've been feeling these past few weeks. But why don't you want me to stop? I want to. Maybe the only thing I want more is to never touch you again and be around my kids. But I realized what she was really saying. You're the one who's cheating, Karen, not me. There's no deception here. I'm not playing you, setting you up, or plotting some elaborate scheme. Frankly, I don't seem to have that kind of energy anymore. I glanced defiantly at my watch. And now you'd better go, dear, or he'll be worried. She shuddered again and I could see that she suddenly realized how revealingly she had dressed today. You feel like a fool, don't you? Good. Come on in and join the club. John, she begged, can I just stay home, at least for tonight? I'm not really... Absolutely not, I snarled a little too loudly, making her recoil. Honestly, I don't care what you two do. Go ahead and discuss what a monster I am, or what a weak move that is, or entertain each other. I don't care. Sit around and watch a movie and eat ice cream if you feel like it. But you have a date tonight, and you're going to see it through. And at some point, I'm entitled to indulge in a little genuine self-pity, and you can't be here for that. No way. I... I don't... She was taken aback by my insistence. You're really serious about this, aren't you? Absolutely serious. And you're... aren't going to divorce me? Do you still love me? 
I'm not divorcing you. I'm not leaving you. Unfortunately, I still love you. She studied me for a moment, looked down at the table, and then nodded slightly. I won't pretend to understand, she admitted slowly, but I'd probably be a fool not to take you up on your offer, wouldn't I? I suppose that's what most people think. She stood up slowly, her overly feminine figure emphasized by the dress. I averted my gaze. I'd never been a fan of ogling strangers. In the three months since her affair had begun, Karen had gotten in shape. She, like most women, had maintained her gorgeous feminine figure. But in college, she had acquired a little fat around her middle that never disappeared. Now it was gone, and I had never seen her so trim and beautiful before. She spent a fortune on new clothes and even traded in her mom's old minivan for a sleek white SUV. In essence, she had become someone else. Apparently, Carl had been the impetus for her to try on a completely different life. Maybe that's what he gave her in the end. A chance to stop being a wife and mother for a while. I didn't know or care about that. What I did know, though, was that all these changes were giving her away. In fact, it was the SUV and the way she had taken a liking to it that finally brought me out. You see, she wanted it because it mirrored her love partner's car. Both lovers thought it was cute, that they were a match. She bit her lip. What time should I be home? She asked uncertainly. Well, I thought to myself, you always got home from your bachelorette parties around 10, but that was mostly to help keep the lies going, wasn't it? She lowered her eyes and nodded. Then I guess you come home when you're ready to go back. Something about saying that sentence out loud gave me away. For a brief moment, I couldn't keep the sadness in my voice that I'd been so diligently holding back for weeks, and I saw the flicker of guilt on her face when she realized it. She shifted her weight. Really, John? I don't have to go. I don't even want to. You'll go. I don't need your goddamn pity, bitch. What are you going to do while I'm gone? Ha! Huh. I'll be hurting myself, you mean? Or look for a way out? Give up and end it all? Don't flatter yourself. Oh, I looked around the room. If the girls aren't busy, maybe we can go out to eat and rent a movie. Other than that, I've already got a pretty good idea of what to occupy myself with while you're having fun. She nodded sadly, then looked at me like she was afraid she'd never see me again. I... It's okay, I said. Just go. And if you're going to be gone until midnight, be sure to send me a text so I don't worry. She nodded, walked over and leaned in to kiss me. I turned and gave her a peck on the cheek, which she obediently kissed. Then she stood up, adjusted her outfit, and gave me a tired, mirthless smile. I almost feel like a teenager going on a date my father disapproves of. Screw you. Just don't forget to send that message. And tell old Carl that he should be very, very afraid for his future. She rolled her eyes defiantly, trying to give herself some levity. Even she seemed to realize it wouldn't work, but she continued anyway. I'll remember, Daddy, she turned away. I didn't laugh. I don't think she noticed. When she left, I put my head in my hands and concentrated on my breathing for a very, very long time. I felt a somber elation, the same kind you feel when you wake up from a life-threatening operation that scarred you for life. It wasn't easy, but it was done. I was sure there were other moments ahead of me, just as hard or even harder, but now I allowed myself the small victory of knowing that at least one of them was forever behind me. Then, when I was ready, I got up and washed my face in the kitchen sink and went to see if my daughters wanted a taste of pizza. Praise to the Almighty, they were interested. Chapter 2 Saturday morning, Karen got up earlier than usual. I wasn't too surprised. Usually during her bachelorette parties, she would come in around 10 and have a glass of wine in the hot tub before going to bed. It was a relatively new habit that I had at first perceived as an unspoken request for extended time for herself at the end of the day. Now, however, I saw it in a completely different, much more unseemly light. A dip in a hot bath, after all, seemed like the best way to pamper myself. Plus, it helped to wash up before bed. This Friday, however, she didn't get home until 9.30 and showered before staggering tiredly into bed. She looked exhausted, worn out, and more than ashamed. And yet, even in the semi-darkness of this sudden change, 
I couldn't resist studying her clothes, her hair, even the way she walked through the door. My eyes hunted for clues I didn't want to find and didn't care about. And this was my new habit, awfully similar to her own. It manifested itself as a series of questions, so small and unconsciously posed that sometimes it felt like drowning in an inch of water. Was the fabric on the front of her outfit wrinkled? Could it be that the hair curling behind her right ear is a knave that didn't have time to straighten up on the way home? Doesn't she walk funny? The desire to appreciate the inestimable was irresistible. It was also unwanted, and it made me sick that I couldn't control it any more than I did. Of course, I didn't want to know the answers to the questions. I didn't even want to know what those questions were. But just try stopping and see what you get. <laughs> she walked into the kitchen that Saturday morning in her bathrobe and slippers, a look of determination on her face with baggy eyes. She set to work as soon as she picked up her breakfast. Just as I'd expected. You caught me off guard last night, she wheezed. She gave me an accusing glare to back up her words and dropped her breakfast on the table with a clamor. If you had given me time to think, just a little time, I would have said no. I would have stayed home, despite your stupid threats, and we would have talked about it. Talk about it. Like adults. She shook her head. You do realize that, don't you? Of course I do, you idiot. But what makes you think I'd even want to talk to you about anything? I was considering the possibility that you might do something like that. That you might miss the chance to save yourself in a fit of selfish neglect. I still didn't look up from my paper. That's why I decided not to give you time to think about it. I was doing you a favor. I could feel her annoyed look on me. I was enjoying it. Damn it, John, she snarled, waving her arms around. Look at me. For one goddamn minute, put that goddamn paper aside and look at me. I calmly put the paper aside and gave her my attention. I don't want this to be our marriage. I don't want to live apart from you and you're going to make demands on me about how I spend my time and... She leaned forward, lowering her voice. Furthermore, I don't want to keep doing this to you. I can't keep doing this to you, it's wrong. Well, that was over the top. Doing it to me? I snorted derisively. Oh, I really don't think you understand, Karen. It's not something you do to me. It's not anymore. It's something you've already done. It's been. It's an action. The bullet left the chamber, flew through the air, and lodged deep in the meat and bone. I leaned forward. That may not. Cannot. Can. Did you get that? Did I even get through to you? We can stop harping on this topic because nothing we say will ever change what has been done. You, my dear wife, betrayed me. You lied and cheated. Our family. Our life together. It will never, ever be a part of your story or the story of our marriage. It will never be a part of who you are. And while it's certainly not what I wanted, you made the decision without any input from me. And now you don't like living with the consequences, but you can't undo it just because you've discovered that your little adventure has terrible consequences for the rest of your life. Stop it, John. Just stop it. There were tears in her eyes. They must have seemed quite real. Does our marriage mean nothing to you? Don't you really care at all? It's so damn unfair that... Don't talk to me about fair! My fist came crashing down on the table, knocking over my juice and spilling it all over the floor. I didn't even notice I was moving. Shit. Closing my eyes, I took a long, deep breath and thought of cool mountain streams. Then, regaining my composure a bit, I continued. If you look at your situation clinically... If you really step back and think about alternatives, then I think you'll begin to understand where this doubt you're experiencing now is coming from. It's not love. It's not hope. It's not concern for your marriage. It's guilt and it's fear. Do you understand? They're not based on rational thought. They're not driven by any desire. And they're certainly not indicators of what you really want. I sipped my coffee. The current situation is the situation that works best for you, and that's the only thing left for me. And while I appreciate the fact that you're concerned, you don't need to be. Not about me, not anymore. It doesn't do anyone any good. You haven't cared about me in a long time. So why change? I leaned over and wiped up the spilled juice. I meant what I said last night, Karen. I have no feelings for you right now, 
and I don't know that this situation won't be permanent. Just the thought of touching you makes me sick. So on this one very important issue, you and I are at odds. I also doubt I can be this close to you without my hands around your throat. I'm not willing to risk it to find out. But I also meant it when I said that I love you and that I have no intention of leaving. Of course, my feelings may change in the future, as may your feelings for me. But the only way I can see right now to leave is if you start using your affair to publicly humiliate me, start showing signs that you're falling in love, or break off the relationship and try to force me to be with you in a way that I don't want to do. John, I want you to be happy, I insisted loudly. Can we both at least admit that this is the best and probably the only way to accomplish that? No. I'm afraid it is. She swallowed. I don't want to believe that. I don't care what you want to believe. I held up my hands, exhaled through my nose, and changed tactics. Do you realize, Karen, how happy you've been these past few months? Silence. Oh, yeah, I waved my hand. Smiling, relaxing, laughing at bad jokes, and listening to the girls tell you about their day. You were more cheerful and attentive than I've ever seen you before. I'm hardly lying about that either. When you start to feel guilty about how good your time away is, you show amazing flashes of deep care and concern. Maybe if you see it your way, it will become true for all time. The girls will benefit from it, and you'll stay out of my hair. Come on, do something for someone else for a change, Karen. John, she stammered, I... I didn't realize... Of course you didn't realize. Why would you? Your attention was elsewhere. She tilted her head. I wasn't trying to throw that in your face, you know. I swear I didn't try. It's just... When I was... With him? I missed you. All of you, I mean. My family. It made me realize... She covered her mouth with her hand, trying not to cry. I know. I took a bite from my food. But then... That was three weeks ago? When his mom got sick? He flew out to see her and you couldn't see each other for four or five days? I shook my head and grinned unfunnily. You really have turned into a monster, haven't you? I haven't seen you this angry since you had all that pain during your second pregnancy. I paused to poke at my food with my fork some more. I didn't bother to take a bite, however. And I don't think I've ever seen you so angry. Never? We took the brunt of your anger over being denied something we couldn't even give you. And how fair was that? Now she was crying in full voice. I... I didn't mean to. Good. Break her, and then help her see her way back. And don't you dare give her a chance to reconsider her options. The thing is, you were generally happier than I can ever remember. And it affected your behavior in the house. It affected me and the kids, too. Your happiness made everyone's life a little easier. So why would any of us want it to go away? I want to be happy with you, she insisted wetly. But we don't get to choose, do we, bitch? You're happy with me. It's just that what you're doing with him confirms it. I'm so scared, she wiped her nose with the sleeve of her robe. I'm afraid you're going to leave me. You know I won't. She shook her head. But why aren't you afraid? If we were separated... If you did this to me, I'd... I would... God. I decided that she ought to be a little frank, and at least just on this one point. So far, she had been so patient and accepting of all my little lies. One little truth might be granted. I'm terrified, Karen. In fact, I'm terrified. Do you want to know why? She nodded. I'm scared because it turns out I'm all alone. Do you have any idea what that feels like? No, of course you don't. I set my fork aside. For a very long time, I thought I had a lot of things going for me. I was privileged, you know? Victorious. I looked away. Now I find that I have almost nothing to lose, and I'm very afraid that I won't be able to protect and keep it. And it just so happens that you're not on that list. <laughs> but maybe she already knew that because she ran out of the room in tears. I just got up, another mission accomplished, and put the dishes in the sink. Then I went outside to do some lawn work. When I came in a few hours later, wiping the sweat from my face with my sleeve and anticipating a cool shower, the contents of the envelope, I mean envelope, were strewn across our bed. I'd been waiting for this. 
I had even left it for her, knowing that her curiosity would eventually lead her to see for herself how complete my understanding of her infidelity was. The transcripts, the photos, the CDs and DVDs, everything was in plain sight. Now she knew. She was in the bathroom with the shower on. The girls had gone to a friend's house, so there was no need to worry about them finding the smutty things that were now on display on my bedspread. I went to make myself some more coffee and left it there. Twenty-five minutes later, she emerged in sweatpants, a tank top, and a look of newfound insecurity. Ever since she'd given up on our marriage, there was a confidence in her that might have been commendable under other circumstances, but it made me sick to my stomach to know its source. In any case, sometimes it bordered on arrogance, and when it did, she became difficult to be around. Still, not for the first time recently, I noted how beautiful she looked. I watched her with the nonchalant detachment that a normal person might experience when walking through a museum. I could see amazing aesthetic beauty and feel nothing about it, mean nothing except that I knew she existed. My God, in the last few months she had lost ten years. Those years gained through her infidelity had been ruthlessly stolen from my own face. I wasn't so blind that I couldn't see that I had aged considerably over the same period of time. I just couldn't bring myself to care anymore. Hi, she offered sheepishly, looking unhappy and not meeting my gaze. Her eyes were red, and she ran her thumb over them as she entered the room. You looked over the report, I remarked, handing her a cup of coffee and inviting her to seat down. She nodded. I didn't realize that. I mean, I know you said you knew everything, but... She sipped her coffee. If it helps that knowing everything is exactly why I decided to stay. If all I had was a few grainy snapshots of you sleeping with him. I think I would have handled it a lot differently. And we'd both be worse for it, by the way. Knowing everything made me realize you were still interested in us. Even if the returns were getting smaller and smaller for all the other investors. Well, I certainly didn't feel like a good person seeing it all laid out like that. She sipped her coffee. It was even harder to realize that everything I'd looked at and heard, you'd seen and heard too. Realizing that you knew everything we did together, everything I told him. She looked up. You even knew about the car. I nodded. She shook her head in surprise. And you didn't even try to stop me. You let me trade in our family van with all its memories, and you knew exactly why I wanted that SUV from the beginning. Oh no, I didn't. You can't take it out on me. At that point, I didn't know yet. In fact, the fact that you wanted that car, that particular car, was part of what made me ask questions. You think I didn't notice it was exactly like Carl's? You should have seen your face when you noticed it in the parking lot. I clenched my jaw. Like a goddamn kid's. For Christmas. She made a grimace. Like a baby's. That seems like a good description for me lately. No. Happy. Happy is a good description for you lately. And maybe that's all that matters. The rest... I waved my hand dismissively. She looked at me skeptically. You can't expect me to believe that you're not dying inside, John. Christ, I can see it written all over your face. That's strange, Karen, because you certainly didn't notice it before. In fact... You hardly saw me at all. Okay, so I'm hurt, I shrugged. Would it hurt less if I left? Or if you had left? If you stopped seeing him, stopped being happy, and we had to go through the whole experience of trying and failing to restart our love life? When you're not interested and I'm not able to handle it, would that make me stop suffering? I shook my head. I have a wife I truly love and two wonderful children who mean everything to me. Right now, they're the happiest I've ever seen them. I can live with the pain if that's the payback. You will never take my children away from me. I promise you this. I will say and do whatever it takes to make sure that doesn't happen. I don't like being the one to hurt you. Ha. Huh. That's rich. You do a lot of things, Kay, but only one hurts me. I hurt like I've never been hurt before, and it's getting more painful by the second. I smiled. Don't make it any more than it has to be. Sometimes I wish you'd just kill me. Isn't that pathetic? Sometimes I succumb to sadness so much that I wish I could be killed. She didn't calm down in the least. I don't understand. How can you be ready for a life like this? Are you kidding me? I was ready to live like that, Karen. And have been for some time, by the way. But how can you just leave it at that? 
How can you not want to fight for more? I leaned forward impatiently. The value of this conversation compared to my plans was rapidly diminishing, and I needed to finish it. Do you still love me? I asked quietly. Of course, she predictably declared. Then that's that. I shrugged. That's just how it is, okay? She pushed away from the table and rushed to me, wrapping her arms around me and burying her head in my chest. I hugged her like that, letting her cry into me for a few moments and fighting the urge to plop her on the floor, then pulled back and let her come to her senses. So what do we do now? She asked sorrowfully. We keep doing what we've been doing. That's what we do. It seems like the whole world has been turned upside down. So be it. As long as we're in the well of gravity, it doesn't matter to us. I guess. She looked up at me. What? What about today? Today? What are we going to do today? I mean, she shifted her weight. Did you have plans? I wrinkled my nose. There was something about her fidgeting that told me far more than she meant to say. Well, I said, choosing my words carefully. I have a new book. I'm looking forward to a day when I can relax and sit at home reading it. She looked pleased. You didn't want to, well, I don't know, go out or, or do anything in particular. Disgusted. If you're going to ask permission, at least have the strength to not be such a coward. Yeah, I lied through gritted teeth. Just a quiet day, lost in my book. Then I turned back to the window and gave my words a casualness that took all my strength away. The children won't be back until after dinner, so AI, a quiet, peaceful day, is just perfect. I heard movement behind me. She touched my arm. Tell me you'll be here when I get back. You know I will. That doesn't mean I don't want to hear it, she whispered. I didn't say anything back, but just continued to stare out the window at the quiet, familiar world. After a few moments, curiosity took over, and I turned around to the silence. She was gone. Well, thank goodness. <laughs> a few minutes later, she emerged from the bedroom in stretchy pants and a sports bra, carrying a bag. When she saw me looking at her, she picked it up and said, As soon as I realized that you... No. I thought it was stupid to hide it in the car. I shrugged indifferently. I was well aware that she had an official bag for office romances and what was in it. For a moment, we both looked at each other, me sitting in a chair with a book I had no intention of reading, and her with a duffel bag and an impatience that made my stomach hurt. She looked a little embarrassed and temporarily unsure of what to do, but then she smiled and timidly offered to play on her silly joke from the night before. I won't be too late, Daddy. She brushed a strand of hair back from her face. Such a simple movement, and so amazingly beautiful. I looked away. Chapter 13 That Friday, the Baileys had one of their frequent neighborhood gatherings. I say neighbors, but it was actually a hodgepodge of families from the neighborhood served by the nearby elementary school. You know how it is. You can rest assured that it didn't start with the husbands or the kids, but we still had a good time. We had always attended events like this, but this was different. I knew Carl would be there. He didn't quite fit in with the couple's crowd, but he was Tom Bailey's drinking buddy and never missed a party invitation if he had the choice. Now I wondered if he used those parties as a way to suck up to his married friend's wives. I had tried to avoid him since I found out. He made it pretty easy, I suppose, by avoiding me in return. But I also knew that being around other people would be nice for a change, and that the kids would have a good time. So, while it was very tempting to decline, it was also very tempting to, to cite the flu, or an emergency, and thus avoid seeing that son of a bitch. I decided I'd get up the courage to go anyway. Besides. I didn't want him to think he could scare me off that easily. In a way, showing up at the party was like making a statement. Karen was visibly excited. Whether she saw it as an opportunity to bond as a couple, as a way to reassure herself that she could really have her cake and eat it too, or just as a chance to spend some sneaky time with her boyfriend, I couldn't tell. I'm not sure I cared at all. But when we first arrived, she uncharacteristically stayed close to me and I got the impression that she was trying to send a message to either me or someone else. I threw a few questioning looks at her, but she ignored them. Right. Play innocent. But judging by the way she kept her hands or eyes on me at all times, it had to be intentional. The Bayless always made sure their parties had plenty of booze, and as the night wore on, 
A combination of nerves and excitement seemed to take its toll on Karen. She drank more than usual, faster than she should have, and it really showed. She was relaxed, playful, and noticeably less scared than when we arrived. By the time the sun started to get lower, she pulled away from me to go socialize. When that finally happened, I don't think she looked back at me once, so I guess the reunion theory fell away on its own. It wasn't long before I noticed that she and Carl happened to be in the same conversation group. It didn't happen too often, but often enough. And my clairvoyance told me that it was done on purpose to make it look like a coincidence, which it definitely wasn't. They never did anything that would alert the uninformed, but for those who were already in the know, it was hard not to notice the way their eyes lit up when they looked at each other, or the way Karen laughed a little too hard at Carl's jokes. Especially when she thought no one else was paying attention. The evening progressed, and the drinks continued to pour in rivers. A few times when the conversation got particularly lively or laughter broke out, Carl would put his hand on Karen's shoulder, or she would touch his chest. It was never enough to give them away, but it touched my heart and caused an unsolicited heat in my gut. Jesus Christ, I thought. Is she messing with me? How could she do this right in front of everyone? What the hell was she thinking? Did she even care about anything? Or about anyone? Somehow I thought I could hide the extent of my pain from her and count on her to respond appropriately. I thought she would be human enough to grasp a modicum of the truth. Obviously, I was wrong. As I watched, the group they were in dispersed, leaving the two of them alone for a few moments. They were talking quietly, Carl was leaning into her slightly, and Karen was giggling playfully. And then Karen did something that completely stunned me. She looked around the party, her eyes scanning the mass of her friends with a kind of arrogant amusement, and she laughed. <laughs> That's when I finally realized what they were really up to. They were playing a damn game with us. They must have talked it out in advance. Probably before I ran into her, though she obviously didn't see fit to cancel. I could just hear how intrigued they must have been. Let's see how far we can get by pretending to be a couple in plain sight, so no one will notice what we're up to. That's why Karen made sure to stay close to me and maintain physical contact with me. It was both a signal to her partner in crime that it wasn't safe to start the game yet, and a way to reassure me that I wouldn't notice what pranks she was up to later. Being close to me was just a way for her to prepare for the game. I leaned on the railing, suddenly feeling very tired. My wife had used me as a prop to play a romantic game with her lover in front of our closest friends. She used those friends as props too. Our friends. To the two of them, we were all just toys, just people they could fool. I looked around the party. These were people who had treated us well over the years. Much better than Carl, I realized. Why would anyone want to treat them like that? Had Karen changed so much in the last six months that she considered this behavior acceptable? What had happened to her morals? Huh. What a stupid question I'm asking now. I turned around to where Karen and Carl were standing. They were already gone. I frowned and scanned the party, hoping to find them. When that didn't work, I wandered around a bit, expecting to spot them among some new company. But I didn't see anything. I walked through once more, trying not to look desperate in my hunt. Several times I had to politely deflect attempts to strike up a conversation. I looked around the backyard twice before entering the house on the pretense that I needed to use the restroom. There was nothing there either. Then, walking past the living room and back to the street, I saw them. Through the large windows facing the street, I saw them partially obscured by the ornamental foliage of Bailey's lawn. Karen was leaning against a tree and Carl, leaning forward, had one hand on the tree above her head. They talked. Or rather, he talked and she took in every word he said. Then his expression changed, becoming more seductive, and he leaned closer. As I watched, they shared a long and tender kiss. A, a love kiss. A gentle and terrifying kiss. Finally, they separated. She said something to him, and he nodded. In spite of everything else I had seen and heard, the, the words they exchanged when they were together. The intensity of their lovemaking and her obvious enjoyment of it, nothing hurt me as much as what I had just seen. When people talk about lovers becoming one, they don't mean entertainment. They're talking about exactly the kind of tender and sincere connection I'd just witnessed. My stomach flipped and I ran to the bathroom and threw up. I was overwhelmed with agonizing emotions. 
How did they manage to hurt me like this after all these years? After everything I had seen and heard? The obvious answer was that on some level I still loved Karen, no matter what. Once that love had been a godsend. Now it was an endless punishment heaped upon me for unknowable transgressions. But even that didn't explain the violent reaction. The kiss hit me as hard as it would have if I had been completely unprepared for it. It was like rediscovering betrayal. It was like losing her all over again. I didn't realize. My thoughts were interrupted when I vomited violently again. There was a knock on the door, and Tom Bailey's concerned baritone called out, Is everything all right in there? I flinched. Great, just what I needed. Concerned friends. I'm fine, I lied. I... almost done. Muttering voices were heard outside the door. Is that John? A woman asked. Does anyone know? I think it's John, she insisted. Brad Millens jumped up. Did I hear someone got sick in there? Alice thinks it's John, Tom explained. He's got a weird voice. Where's Karen? Asked Alice nervously. Somebody get Karen. He's been sitting with us most of the night. Jesus, it had to be Albert Burke. I didn't realize he was drinking so much. Maybe it's the flu. It's out of season for him. Alice. He certainly didn't drink that much, Albert repeated. And then, as if teasing fate itself in the schoolyard, came Carl's light, humor-filled voice. Well, you know, some people, he grumbled, just don't know how to handle liquor well. I'm fine, I immediately shouted. I'm fine, and I'm coming out. Standing up and flushing the toilet, I walked over and rinsed my face in the sink. The voices died down, and a second later I heard another knock on the door. A quiet knock, touched with the hesitation that such sounds can have. John? Karen's concerned voice rang out. John, are you okay in there? I took a deep breath, holding back the response that slammed into my chest. Then I turned, opened the door to the hallway, and looked her in the eye. Me and the girls are leaving, I snapped back. Right now. If you don't want to go, then don't go. I don't care. You can ask your damn boyfriend for a ride. I don't care. Karen's eyes widened slightly, and the color left her face a little. A lot must have been going through her head at that moment, not the least of which was that I hadn't bothered to look around and make sure we were alone before pouncing on her to criticize her boyfriend. In anger, I could have easily revealed her despicable little secret. Well, don't expect an apology, bitch. You could have easily done the same thing with your stupid little game. Hell, you know someone saw you and the gossip is already heating up. So, I guess you have something to think about now, don't you? Now, no, no. She also must have realized that something must have happened to make me so angry. She knew I could hold my temper, had seen firsthand that I hadn't been drinking much tonight, and knew me well enough to know when I was furious. So I thought it was very telling that she didn't ask what was wrong or pretend to be upset with me. I guess she just didn't want to know the truth. Let me get my purse, she stammered. I'll be right back. Don't leave without me. Then she fled in the direction of the party. For a moment after her departure, the house was empty. I guess everyone had left to give me some privacy while I recovered from my supposed drinking binge. I fumbled in my pockets for my car keys, walked out into the main living room and tried to calm myself down. Peeking out the patio door, I saw Karen grab her purse off the table, which she had left behind and hurriedly say goodbye to the people she had just laughed at. Carl walked over, trying to look nonchalant and failing once again, and said something to her as she walked by. A short conversation between the lovers ensued, in which Carl looked slightly troubled, and Karen gave out an intense excitement, a, a bitter excitement that made her grow more and more animated as she spoke. Her face reddened, her eyes widened, and she made numerous movements with her hands. If I didn't know better, I'd say I was watching a little love spat. Finally, nerves drew Carl dangerously close to her, and he said something under his breath. Her shoulders slumped upward, almost to her ears, and she glanced around the party, perhaps checking the other guests for awareness. None of them seemed to notice the obvious. She looked at Carl again, stepped back, and he said something else to her, which made her shake her head. He continued to speak. She shook her head again. He moved closer to her again, this time looking at her with hurt puppy eyes, and spoke one last time. She paused, 
made a tiny nod, and turned to leave. I watched him watch her with his gaze, noting the cocky half-smile that appeared as soon as she turned away and struggled to contain my rage. The ride home passed in silence. Karen stared out the side window with an almost complete lack of expression on her face. I wondered what she was thinking. Was she embarrassed by her behavior? Scared that she might have gone too far? Angry at me for ruining all her fun? Angry at Carl for pushing her into a game she now regrets? Or maybe she was just glad she'd had her fun and to hell with everything else? As far as I knew, she wasn't thinking about me at all. And maybe that was okay with me. When we got home, the kids ran downstairs to play video games, and Karen pulled an already opened bottle of Chardonnay out of the refrigerator. As she walked over to the cupboard, she glanced at me, probably contemplating whether to get me a glass, but I went straight to the master bathroom and locked the door. I turned on the shower, let it heat up, then stepped in and just stood there. I didn't think, I didn't feel, I didn't imagine, dream, wish, or desire anything at all. I just let the water wash over me as I hoped it would do to me someday. I let the water run over me and then go down the drain, never to worry again. Chapter 4 Karen apologized to me the next day, though it was a brief and unspecific sorry. It was obvious she didn't want to go into detail, even to find out exactly what I had seen or realized. Typical cheater mentality. She would turn a blind eye to the awfulness of her behavior at the very moment she was reassuring herself by apologizing. After a few minutes of forced small talk and awkward silence, she tentatively suggested that maybe we'll all feel better after our trip to the zoo tomorrow. Tomorrow? I tilted my head, feigning surprise. We're not going tomorrow. Of course we are. We're... You've got your days mixed up, Karen. Today is Saturday. We're going today. No, she stretched patiently, looking at me spitefully. We're going on Sunday. We talked about it. I shook my head in feigned desperation. Jesus Christ, what are you even talking about? We scheduled the zoo for Saturday, Karen. Today. We've talked about it over and over again, don't you remember? She blinked, her eyes darting around as if she were calculating something. She looked so nervous and confused that I almost broke out into a smile. What's the matter? Is it hard to juggle two lives when you can't control one? She was actually right. We had indeed picked Sunday when we'd discussed the trip earlier that week. But the more I thought about her antics at the party, and especially that kiss, the less I wanted to be around her. So I talked to the girls about it when I put them to bed the night before and told them that if they behaved themselves, we could go to the zoo a day early. Now Karen looked determined. You've made a mistake, she insisted. I'm pretty sure we said Sunday. I studied her for a moment, letting my annoyance at her recent behavior show openly on my face so that it could be translated as annoyance at this stupid forgetfulness. Then I turned and shouted into the living room. Hey girls, what are we doing today? We're going to the zoo, they both replied in jubilant unison. I turned around to Karen with a tired look on my face. See, I said, it's today. Even the girls know that, so cut the crap. Anyway, I don't see why it matters. It's just a one-day difference. It's no big deal, right? She looked embarrassed. Actually, she stretched out. I kind of have plans for today. I somehow managed to look surprised. Holy shit, bitch. I saw you making them up, right in front of everyone, at a goddamn party thrown by our friends. Or do you still think you're so much smarter than the rest of us that no one notices these things? But I didn't raise my eyebrows, feigning disappointed surprise. Needless to say, I was actually relieved. Although that little exchange between her and Carl had been pretty obvious, and I was sure they'd agreed on something, there was always the risk of miscalculation. For all I knew, those plans could have been for Monday. Or for something they were doing the following weekend. Or a damn month from now. All I could rely on was the certainty that they were no doubt making plans. I hoped it would happen soon. From what I could see through the window, I envisioned it something like this. Are we still on for tomorrow? I don't know, Carl. He's really pissed off. Maybe I should... Don't do that. It was his choice. He gave you permission reluctance, or maybe just guilt. I shouldn't. Puppy eyes. You're hurting my feelings, baby. Okay. A pause. Okay. 
I'll be there. And then she was gone. Maybe it wasn't the exact wording, but I knew what I saw. An agreement, confirmed and honored. And frankly, I was counting on her to see that agreement through. The last thing I wanted to do was spend the day next to her, talking to her and sharing my life with her. I didn't want to be around her. And if that meant she had to be with him, then so be it. She shifted her weight. She was still waiting for an answer and probably expected anger. It's better to let it be. I wouldn't have to pretend to be mad at her, would I? Plans? I growled, shaking my head. You've got to be kidding me, Karen. Last night's disgusting games weren't enough for the two of you? Can't you devote a single day to your family before you run off to get yours again? She responded with irritation. This was your idea. I'm just playing by your rules. Ah. Uh. So he was forcing the idea on her. It wasn't an argument she'd come to on her own. But it was similar to what Carl would have said. Anyway, she snorted irritably. It's just one day. The girls will understand. They won't have to, I snapped back. Because we are going to the zoo, with or without you. Don't you dare, she shrieked. They're my kids, too. You're not going to start. You're right. I interrupted. I'm not going to start. I'm not going to change plans. I'm not going to cut back on family time. I'm not going to start living up to your goddamn sins. My what? She stared at me. Look, mister, if you don't take pleasure in the idea that I... I jumped to my feet and she backed away, panting. Honestly, I think she cut off the phrase with an expression of horror before I even started moving. At least I give her credit for that. She may have gone far enough to simmer with disrespect for me, but not so far that that fact doesn't embarrass her in the slightest. For a second, we both stared at each other, both angry, both unsure of what should happen next in such a confrontation. Then arrogance took over, her mouth curved, and she hissed, Fine, have it your way. You want to spend the day playing mommy, that's fine with me. The girls and I can just go do something fun when I pick them up from school tomorrow. She half turned away, casting a grimly confident glance at me over her shoulder. S. Without. With you. And then she was gone. I shook my head, trying not to feel offended. That's what I wanted, right? For her to leave me? To give myself some peace and quiet? Maybe even forget about my problems for a while and enjoy spending time with my kids? So why did victory seem as empty and crushing as defeat to me? And I went inside and told the girls that mom couldn't make it to the zoo, but we could go as soon as they got dressed and brushed their teeth. Since it didn't affect their ability to claim the prize in any way, it didn't elicit much of a response. They only pretended to pout at mom for half a second and then ran to get ready. I had to smile slightly. Such simple wishes. Then I sat down to read the paper while I waited. I hadn't seen or heard anything about Karen during all of this. For all I knew, she had packed her things and slipped out of the house right after our fight. The thought that she might have already left and that I wouldn't have to watch her go brought a tired comfort. At least I wouldn't have to hear that damn bye-daddy joke again. The sound of water pouring in the bathroom passed my ears, a sure sign that the girls had moved on to the final stage of brushing their teeth. I got up and gathered everything I needed for the trip to the zoo. I was just finishing up my work when they flew into the kitchen, full of youthful energy and joy. For a few moments, I basked in the purity of that gorgeous, simple happiness. Are you two ready to go? I asked. Asked me? Yes, promised me. And guess what? Intervened Susie, flashing a toothy grin. Mommy's coming too. Before I could explain that no, Mommy wouldn't actually be able to join us, Karen entered the room, shuffling. She was wearing a deeply apologetic look and undoubtedly a mommy at the zoo outfit. Oh. I shook my head and looked away, feeling, what? Disappointed? Angry? Relief? I don't even know how I feel anymore. Hi, she offered unconvincingly. You decided to join us. It wasn't a question. It's... She leaned over and, glancing around to make sure the girls couldn't hear, whispered, Okay? I shrugged. There's not much I can do about it now. They've already made up their minds. She shuddered. I guess I can be such an asshole sometimes, can't I? More than you can imagine. I shrugged, not knowing what to do. My plans had fallen apart and now I was stuck with her for the day. 
There was no way to reset with the kids excitedly bouncing around us. Karen had decided to stay and there was nothing I could do about it. So why didn't I feel worse than I really did? Thanks a lot, Carl. You couldn't help me even this time, could you? Well, I said as the girls began to show impatience, there's no point in waiting. Let's go. The day was unexpectedly pleasant. I had fully expected the growing distance between Karen and me to become a heavy blanket for every ray of sunshine, but it turned out to be the opposite. The joy of our adventure together seemed to push back the ever-looming darkness for a moment. Sure, the bond that had once bound us together was lost, but it had been part of our essence for so many years that it was easy to pin it back in place. So for a few beautiful hours, my family was whole again. The girls were a big part of it. They laughed, they ran around, they enjoyed the casual comfort of knowing their parents were looking out for them. What they didn't realize was that this idea of their parents as a unit no longer existed. They believed that the world remained as it should be, and with the galloping energy of their living fantasy assumptions, it seemed that for a while they were right. An even simpler path was laid between Karen and me. It began, most obviously, with silence. For my part, I was determined to maintain it, but that, of course, proved impossible. You simply can't take your kids into the bonfire of freedom, choice, and wide-open spaces without at least a little bit of communication with your spouse. So, grudgingly, I skipped the slightest of interactions. And that messed things up. The question, where should we go next time, led to, we really liked the rainforest exhibit last year, remember? Which led to a small smile and a rush of fond memories, which led to more conversations. Maybe you've been there, maybe you know. When you have so much history between you, rebellion becomes as easy as a happy memory. Before you know it, you're talking about the safest, warmest topic on earth. Those times in the past when you saw your children smiling. So, oddly enough, I'd say we got along better during this trip than we have in years, even if the reasons for doing so were upsetting. I know it affected Karen, judging by the way her cheeks flushed and she couldn't stop smiling. It was almost the same for me as the fog of a new relationship is for you. And it's strange. Perhaps inexplicable. But it's no less true. Somehow, for a few hours, it all seemed sparkling new. By the time we piled into the van at sunset, I'd had such a wonderful time that I hadn't thought about Karen's infidelity for the longest time since the day I learned the truth. Can you ask for a better gift than one that makes you forget? They say the devil is in the details. I don't know about that. But he's definitely a master of the surgical strike. We were about ten minutes away from the zoo, heading home on the highway, when the most unremarkable of sounds woke me up from what was, truth be told, the silliest little fantasy of my life. Karen's cell phone vibrated in her purse. It probably could have been any call if it weren't for the fact that she hadn't bothered to check it or answer it. She just covered her purse with her coat to muffle the sound and stared out the window until it ended. That in itself told me all I needed to know. And just like that, as quickly as throwing on a coat over a buzzing cell phone, the, the joy and lightness vanished. The heart of the moment was lost. But it wasn't just that. I suddenly felt as sad and as tired as I had ever felt in my life. Like a prisoner who has been told he is being led to freedom, says goodbye in dreams of the future, and is unceremoniously pushed into a room with an injection table. I focused on the road and tried not to think. I wished this day had never happened so I could avoid what I was feeling right now. Karen and the kids kept a positive attitude, laughing and talking about everything we had done that day, and I answered a little to keep up appearances, but my heart didn't lie to it anymore. When we pulled up to the house and closed the garage door, I sat silently while everyone else got out of the car. Aren't you coming? asked Karen when I didn't move from my seat. I need a minute, I replied quietly, still looking ahead as if keeping my eyes on the road. Is something wrong? She frowned. No. Silence. She didn't move. Are you sure? I'm just tired, I insisted. Please. She took a deep breath and reached out to touch my hand. Just a minute, I insisted. Can I have one little minute before I go in? She flinched, opened her mouth as if she wanted to say something else, then sighed and followed the girls into the house. I don't know what happened. Maybe it was the weight of feelings I'd been carrying around for so long. 
Maybe it was just me stepping over the line and accidentally stepping over it. Or maybe I was just so sad. I can't say for sure. But as soon as they closed the door of the house, I pressed my forehead against the steering wheel and sobbed like a baby. It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. I'd never been a crier, not even when I was a baby. But now I was crying the way grief-stricken parents cry on the days of their child's absence. I cried like I was the last person at the funeral. And it went on and on. All I wanted to do was stop. To catch my breath and feel like I was in control again. But each new sob felt like it was being pulled out of me by something deep inside. I was so relieved when the sobs finally began to subside that I almost laughed. For a few moments, I didn't believe it would ever end. Sitting up, I put my hand to my chest and concentrated on calm, deep breathing until I decided I had gathered myself enough to go inside. I figured I'd stop in the hallway bathroom, wash my face, and no one would know that I... And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. No. I turned around. Our eyes met. She was standing just a few feet away from me with her hand over her mouth, fat tears rolling down both cheeks. Guilt, pity, and pain fought each other on her face, and each of them made me feel sick. And then she turned and ran back into the house. God damn it. Damn it. I pounded my fist on the steering wheel, looked for something else to hit, found nothing, and just hit the steering wheel again. God damn it. 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 Just one thing. That's all I asked for. Just one little thing I could keep. Just one little thing that would be just for me. Yeah, she didn't leave that night, but after that we never spoke to each other again. I pretended to watch TV and she pretended I didn't know she was looking at me. After the girls went to bed, she went out on the deck, pulled out her cell phone, and talked for over an hour. Her face was tense and her eyes downcast. Chapter 5 Hi the icebreaker said timidly on a Sunday morning. Did you sleep well? Hardly, never at all. I slept well. She sipped her coffee. Thanks for last night. I had a great time. She looked at me. I'm sorry it ended like that. Me too. There was a long, drawn-out silence. John? Yes? Why are you doing this to yourself? Be calm. We've been through this before. I know, it's just, I can't shake the feeling that there has to be a better way. Some way for us to... I looked up at her sharply, and she fell silent. I stood up then, dumped out the rest of my cereal, and left the room. I spent the next few hours doing chores and poking around on the internet. Karen made no further attempt to strike up a conversation with me, and for a while I thought the message had been received. Then, a little after lunch, she took the girls to a friend's house, and when she returned, she had disappeared into the bedroom. I didn't hesitate long. I heard the shower running. It would get rid of her from me. And it wasn't that I wanted her. So why was I still plagued by these thoughts? Why were my insides twisting and tearing like they were sandwiched between two huge spinning gears? I pushed that question away, banished it from my mind, and looked for a way to distract myself. Because this really works. The situation was much worse than I had anticipated, however, because about 30 minutes later, the door to my office opened and there she stood. The girls are gone, she cooed, in a voice that could only come from someone who knows exactly how good they look and is sure of your reaction. I thought you might want to spend some time together. Don't do that, Karen, I warned. It won't help anything. It'll only make things worse. She moved forward. I'm not trying to fix anything. I just wanted to show you. Stop. I interrupted her as she started to approach. Don't you dare come any closer. Not now, and certainly not in those clothes. Her face tensed, but she ignored me and pressed forward. You know I can make it so you won't regret it. I slammed my hands on the table and jumped to my feet. I said, stop. This time she actually stopped, and a little of her confidence seemed to fade away in the process. Please, John she pleaded, determined to let the vulnerable woman continue what the sultry seductress had failed to do. I just want you by my side. I sincerely do. I've missed it more than you can imagine. Say, I threw her a look that should have told her exactly what I thought of that statement. Tell me something, I snapped back. Who made you wear those outfits? Because I don't remember you wearing them for me before. Not once. She flinched. But I... Like them? 
I thought you did too. I stood in the doorway, turned, looked at her, and shook my head. She looked embarrassed, maybe even a little humiliated. Welcome to the club. Unshed tears stood in her eyes. I wouldn't touch you for anything, I spat on the floor for emphasis. You see, I took an oath to be faithful to my wife, to share myself only with her, and I insist on sticking to that vow. It means something to me. And now... I looked her over with disgust. She's not here. I slammed the door behind me. The next time I saw Karen, she was dressed in sweatpants and curled up in a chair flipping through the channels. She didn't look up at me as I walked by. Her jaw clenched slightly, but I don't think I should have seen it. Works for me, baby. She spent the next two weeks returning to the familiar family member lifestyle that had worked so well for her at the zoo. She still threw glances in my direction, letting me know she was checking to see if the ice was showing signs of thawing. She also didn't mention or ask for time with Carl, which I assumed was part of the strategy. I knew she had to go out with him. I wasn't ready to think otherwise. I just wasn't sure how she was doing it. On Thursday of the second week, I decided to investigate. Just after lunch, I picked up the phone and called her office and asked for her name. May I know who's calling? I didn't often contact her through work channels, usually preferring to text her if I needed to chat. It's her husband, I explained. There was silence on the other end. Is something wrong? I asked. I'm sorry, sir, but Mrs. Sanders is out of town. Ah, uh, Mrs. Sanders. So you don't believe I'm her husband? Probably because she told you he was the one she was going to be with. Well, I wasn't going to cover for her. Okay, thanks. I'll talk to her when she gets home, wherever she is. I hung up the phone with an unhappy chuckle. I pondered this new information. I already knew that she had spent a bunch of her vacation time hiding behind my back before I confronted her. Apparently now she was back to her old tricks, secretly dating her lover while trying to patch things up with her husband. But that's not how it works, dear. I decided it was necessary to teach her a little lesson. I did it quietly and discreetly. That weekend, I broke the news to the whole family. Guess what, I announced over dinner. We're all going to Disney World. The girls immediately freaked out, squealed, and started asking the most hilarious questions. I tried my best to answer them, but Karen just stared across the table at me with a look that somehow combined doubt, shock, anger, and horror. Disneyland, she finally muttered under her breath. Then her eyebrows drew together and she leaned forward. We can't afford it, John. Our finances are tight as it is. She said the last phrase a little too forcefully. I knew what she really meant. I just shrugged my shoulders. It did set us back, but everything has already been bought and arranged. We certainly won't be able to afford to go again, if that's what you mean. So we'll just have to make the most of this trip. I winked at the girls and then laid out the details. It was a big trip. We were going out of town for a whole week and pretty much wiping out all the financial progress we'd made over the last seven or eight years. It was the kind of, I deserve an award gaffe that a financial planner would cringe at the thought of, and multiplied several times over. I even rented an apartment rather than a hotel room so that we could have an operating base with all the essentials of daily life. Karen was even more stunned when I finished. I, I can't believe you spent all our money without talking to me first, she whispered. Huh? We're suddenly in the habit of talking to each other before making decisions that affect the marriage? I smiled. Then I picked up some food with my fork and shrugged. I think this is the last year before the girls get too old for something like this. Soon it'll stop being magic, so it's now or never. And we need to be with family anyway, so... At the last word, she turned pale. But that's so much money. We'll be fine as long as there are no unexpected hospital bills, the cars keep running, and we don't have to take unpaid leave at work. She turned even paler. John? I, uh, I'm not sure I have enough vacation time for something like that. Huh? I feigned surprise. She blushed and lowered her gaze to the table. I kind of used it quite a bit, actually. I set my fork aside. You've been with the company a long time, Karen. Surely you've earned enough vacation pay over the years. Her blush deepened. Actually, I've... I've used it all. 
or enough to make it a problem. Not only that, but I'm starting to fall behind on some major projects because I've been out of the office so much lately. Read my facial expression for yourself, bitch. Out of the office? Lately? She didn't look up, only nodded slightly. I pretended to ponder that information for a moment, then stood up. So much for being honest about when you see him, I spat. You know, I really thought for a while that you were trying to be part of this family again, Karen. I guess there just can never be enough of us, can there? Then I walked out of the room. She made no attempt to follow me. Sigh. As I sat down in the living room and picked up my book, I couldn't help but smile to myself. Mission accomplished. I get to spend a whole week at Disneyland with my girls and a whole week away from my whore wife. And best of all, it's all credit to her. A few days later, Karen's mom stopped by to visit me. I'm not sure, but I don't think she noticed the distance between us. And if she did, she'd probably be glad she did. Her mother never liked me. In fact, I think she probably hated me. She just had this feminine way of saying it without words. I'd love to tell you that I never understood why, but she was a churchgoer, and I was an honest atheist, so anything else I could say or do on this earth was completely irrelevant. In her opinion, I would never be poison. I wondered what she would think if she found out that her so perfect daughter was giving me horns. Would she be stupidly tickled? Or would she be too scandalized to appreciate my suffering? Honestly, I think it would have depended on who was around to see her reaction. Early on, she noticed that I looked thin. Even men have to buy new clothes if they're going to go on a diet, John. At those words, she rolled her eyes. Anyway, you should know that not everyone looks better when they're skinny. I'm not on a diet, I told her. I just wasn't hungry. Well, try to change that before you drop another belt size. She smiled at her daughter with a sickening sweetness. I'm not sure that will be appreciated. Karen very quietly busied herself with preparing my favorite dish that night and chewed her lip all through dinner, watching me not eat. John, she said softly at one point, looking at the girls and choosing her words carefully. It's hard enough to get them to eat, and then there's Daddy setting a bad example. I gave her a long look, a thousand answers flashing through my mind, but she was right. I sighed and tapped my fork. I'm not feeling well. I'm going to go to bed early. That should have calmed her down at least a little. At least I wouldn't set a bad example anymore. But she only snorted irritably as I shuffled out of the room and headed for bed. Over the next few weeks, Karen tried several times to talk to me about going to Disney. Really, she tried to talk me out of it. There was no pretense, another purpose, or another type of discussion. At first, she was remorseful and apologized for wasting all her vacation time. But as I continued to thwart her attempts, she became more and more irritable and embittered. In the last few days before we left, she became downright vicious. Throwing her novel in my face and making little underhanded remarks about how at least she didn't have to go to Disneyland to have a good time. I ignored them. For some reason, for the first time since her affair began, and her comments didn't seem to bother me. It didn't take her long to realize this, and for reasons I still don't fully understand, her immediate reaction was resentment. I still remember the moment when she made a sarcastic comment about spending the whole week with Carl, and something in my non-reaction told her that it no longer hurt me to hear about it. Suddenly, she was deathly silent. I looked at her, and she was staring at me like a kid whose father had just hit her and called her a whore. Then she just as quickly ran out of the room. I just shook my head and went back to my magazine. I wasn't going to try to make sense of her ridiculous behavior anymore. I knew firsthand that it was a futile endeavor. But for some reason, the image kept me awake and prevented me from concentrating on the article I was reading. After a while, I put it aside and did something I'm not particularly proud of. I walked over to the cabinet above the stove, the one that only I could reach, reached in and pulled out my pack of cigarettes. I had left it there two years ago when I finally managed to quit smoking. This act was motivated by a logic familiar to any addict. I just felt better knowing they were there. But I had never, even with all that had happened, felt the urge to reach for them until that moment. I was standing on the back porch when she found me. When did you start doing that again? She asked. I took a puff. Just now. I coughed. It's not as good as I remember. But I took another puff anyway. 
She was quiet for a moment. Did you want something? I asked. I wanted to apologize. I was... Hell, I don't even know what I've been. But I've been like this and it needs to stop. I shrugged. You know, I finally understand why you're doing this, she said. All this time I've been so vain that I really thought it was about me. I thought you couldn't live without me. Then I lashed out at you tonight and got no reaction. What I said must have hurt you. It would have killed me if the roles had been reversed. But you, she said surprised, you just let it get off on you. And that's when I realized I couldn't hold on to you anymore. And that's when I realized you were done with me. I took another puff and then threw the cigarette away. It's all about the girls, isn't it? You did it all because of the girls. I nodded. And they were so happy. You did such a wonderful job protecting them, she snorted. You ruined your life so they could be kids for a little longer, I mumbled. You're going to... take pictures, right? At Disneyland? She put her arm around her shoulders. They'll never forget this trip. And it will be such a wonderful memory. Suddenly she broke into sobs. It's the... the only... way that... I can... survive. Sure, I'll take pictures. But I didn't say anything else, and I didn't hug her. I just let her cry. She was someone else's problem now. Thank you, she finally said, pulling herself together. Thank you for the pictures. And then she disappeared into the house. The second part of this story is already on my channel. The link is in the description or in the comments.